I'm blessed to be here today. I uh, usually am preaching somewhere or I'm uh, being in Sunday school, teaching Sunday school, and the terms of me being the adult Sunday school uh, superintendent at First Baptist in Ritter are that I can go and preach whenever I, I want to. And so it's my desire to be here with you today. And uh, what I'm going to share with you is uh, on the way here, as we came from DeRitter, we passed by a place that was just an open field. And I told my wife, I said, there used to be a, a trailer sitting out in the middle of that field. I said, in fact, a few years ago, I don't remember how many now, maybe it was eight years ago, uh, one of the men from the church and I went to visit this family. Uh, and uh, they live quite a ways from the church, but hey, you know, we were going to try it. And so uh, we shared with her uh, the message of salvation and, and uh, I explained how she could ask Jesus in the heart, and she said, oh, it's that simple. And I said, yes, and I, I thought, well, you don't want to have to overload her with thoughts, you know. So I said, uh, would you like to pray that prayer? And she said, well, I would. And so uh, she prayed that prayer. We never saw her again, and I don't know whatever happened to her, uh, but uh, I'm sure she missed out on a blessing because she, uh, she didn't understand the whole message. And that's quite common as people today as uh, we gather around uh, Christmas trees and we have nativity scenes and, and we talk about the Christ child and that they, uh, that they really don't understand what they're seeing. You know, they see the innocence of a little baby and, and they don't feel threatened by that baby in any means. You know, that's why it's acceptable because it's safe, you know. And yet uh, there's more to the message than just the Christ child being born. There's more that goes with it. And uh, I want to share with you today what goes with it as well. So if you will, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you'll be in the, the right location. I beg your pardon, I've, I've got it wrong. It's 1 Corinthians. No, it is 2 Corinthians. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves, are we satisfied with our spiritual lives? Are we satisfied with our spiritual lives? Now, I'm, I'm almost afraid to preach this sermon to you because years ago, I, I pastored at Providence, uh, Providence, at Friendship Baptist Church for 13 and a half years, and, and they came out several years ago with a, the uh, 40 Days of Purpose program. I don't know if you did that here, but uh, we did it there, and boy, we went whole hog. You know, we, we did it in Sunday school, we did it on Wednesday nights, we did it in the worship service, did the whole thing. And I was excited, you know, because it calls on you to really walk with the Lord. To be a sold-out Christian, we lost numerous families in our church. They couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it, you know. And the reality is, I, several years ago, I went to Belize, and um, at that time, nobody had evangelized that little country in Central America. And um, you could walk up to a total stranger on the street in town and say, is Jesus the Lord of your life? And they would stop and most of them would say, no. Well, would you like to know more about Jesus? We actually took a plain load of preachers and uh, Sunday school teachers to that country, which has a population about like Baton Rouge uh, at that time. Probably Baton Rouge is bigger now. But uh, uh, there was a singer in his group, Dallas Home and Praise. I don't know if you remember that group, but they went on board the plain load too. And so in, in the town of Belize City, I mean, everybody just scattered out. We, we, you know, evangelized. And they would stop and they would talk to you. They would hear the truth. Uh, one of my friends who went with, with me, we did something. I've never done something before or since then. We walked into a bar and witnessed to people. And the funny look on their face was like, I thought we were safe in here. I mean, we're coming in here even, you know. And, uh, but uh, 10 years later, I went back to Belize. And I tried the same thing, and, and you asked that question, and, and the people just pass you up like you weren't even there, you know. And so I talked to the missionary there in Belize. I said, what happened to this country? And his wife said, the reality is that when you hear the truth, you're going to either respond to it or you're going to harden your heart. You know? And that's what happened to my church. We lost membership because they heard the truth, and they weren't willing to live by it. And so they backed off from it. So that's what I'll sh share with you today, and I, I hope it doesn't cause you to leave the church, that's for sure. Um, most people, if they're honest, 
if you ask them, would you like a, a deeper walk with the Lord? If they're honest with you, they'd say no. Because you know, we're living in a country in which people don't make commitments. You know, they don't want to get married. That means I might have to spend the rest of my life with that person. Or if I want to get rid of them, I might lose part of my income. You know, there's going to be alimony and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Tim Cooley was a, head of, uh, was a deacon in my church, and he's the, the superintendent of schools in, Cal in uh, uh, Borgard Parish. And because uh, I, I used to be a school teacher, and I, I said, uh, is it that way in schools now? He said, oh, yeah. He said, we don't even try to hold people to their contract. You sign a contract, and you go to, to a teaching school, and a week later, you might just say, this is not what I thought it was going to be. I quit. And he said, used to, you could hold them to their contract. You know, they had to stay of the year. He said, we don't even try to do that anymore. People just are not willing to make that kind of commitment. Why not? Because they want to practice their Christianity in comfort. In comfort, you know? In other words, I don't have to do anything that I want to do. Uh, I'm not making any commitment. And, uh, you know, thank goodness we have deacons who are active in the church and Sunday school teachers who are active in the church. But uh, a lot of people, they, you know, decide, well, I wake up on Sunday morning, I, I don't want to, I want to go to church. You know, they're not making a commitment to the Lord. Um, I realized that years ago when my wife and I went as missionaries to the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico, um, I knew that I had to make a real commitment. We were going to be leaving on June the 1st, and I knew that in August. And so in August, I told the church, you need to start looking for a new pastor because we're going to leave on June the 1st. We're going to go work with the Navajos. I, I, told, I was working as a corporation chaplain. I told the company that I worked for, and I said, same thing. And he said, well, will you stay till June the 1st? I said, I certainly will, you know. Uh, I was the director at that time. We had a junior high camp at Dry Creek, and I was the director of the junior high camp. So I, I told the assistant director, I said, next summer is going to be your summer to be the director. He said, why? I said, because I'm not going to be here. He said, where are you going? I said, we're going to New Mexico. And uh, he said, well, suppose God calls me somewhere. I said, well, then that's between you and the next person in line to take over the job, you know. But the reason why I did that is because I wanted to burn the bridges behind me. I didn't want the temptation to turn around and seek comfort where I was. You know, I told God I'd do it, and I wasn't going to let the devil tempt me out of it, you know. So, you know, I'd look like a fool if I'd gone back and say, well, I'm going to be here at Dry Creek this next summer. I've changed my mind, or I'm going to be your pastor, and I'm, I've changed my mind. About January that year when I was pastoring in Providence, so, uh, the church, I, I told them, I said, you know, we are leaving. I said, you need to get a committee together so you can start looking for a pastor. And so one of the ladies said, well, Brother Poole, can, can we pray that you don't go? I said, oh, please do. I said, listen, if I'm wrong, I don't want to go. I said, you can pray all you want. That's fine with me. So maybe there's times in your life that you need to make a commitment and that you need to burn bridges behind you, you know. And, um, well, I found that out in, in Belize when I went there and did a revival there. And that uh, we lived in a jungle village of four of us guys. We lived in a jungle village for a week. And uh, there was no way in or out, or uh, you walked in. And uh, there was no electricity. There was no telephones or anything. And uh, we stayed in that jungle village for, for a week. And uh, we uh, made a commitment to be there. And so we stayed for a week because the pastor who took us out there and turned us loose, he said, I'll be back in a week. And there was no way to call him or anything, you know. So we stayed there for a week. So maybe God is calling you to do something in your life during this Christmas season. You might have been convicted about it and that you're coming up, or the devil's giving you all kind of excuses why not to do it. Now, if you notice, there's one question I didn't ask. How long does Brother Mike usually take in his sermons? How much time do I have? Long as I want. <laughs> Amen. That guy is courting danger. When we lived on the Navajo Reservation, I decided to have a, 
you know, this was all Navajos, and so I decided to have uh, Navajo pastors preach the revival. Uh, it was a family who came in from Oklahoma with a tent. Boy, we set up the tent in the front yard of the church in that village, and, and the first night, Nathan, who was uh, about the age of our son, uh, was a young pastor from First Indian Baptist Church in Gallup, and I'd ask him to do the initial one, and then he was supposed to do the closing at the end of the week. And so he said, how long do I have to preach? I said, as long as the Spirit of God leads you. Now, that was in June. It was two or three years after we got there, and uh, it was cold. Uh, we, we lived over a mile in elevation, and it was cold. We had that tent. I had an insulated vest on. Uh, it was cold. And my wife had all the children, what did you have, 15 kids, something like that, in the church house, and we're out in the front yard, and, and boy, the place is packed. And so Nathan starts preaching at 7 o'clock. He finished at midnight. So later in the week, <laughs> when he came, I said, Nathan, I said, I, I want to tell you something. I said, I don't believe the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to preach for longer than two hours tonight. <laughs> so he got up and announced that when he got up to preach. So anyway, okay, well, I appreciate that authorization from you, and you can deal with that man later. <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful, sunshiny day. And, Lord, we know that there's been some destructive weather over in Texas. We know that weather's coming our way, Lord. We pray that you'll watch over us and keep us safe, Lord. And we pray for those families lost their homes and loved ones over there, Lord. Uh, we pray for Mike as uh, he and his family are coming back, that you watch over them as well. And we thank you for your word, how precious it is, and how we can apply it to our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of the sermon is Faith, Trust, and Action. Faith, trust, and action. Notice that that order, faith, trust, action. I told you about that woman uh, that we had talked with, and she supposedly gave her life to the Lord, uh, claiming to have faith. I don't think she knew what trust was. I certainly don't think she thought that she was going to have to take any action. She thought, like most Christians, you just get, don't put your name on the church, and you've got reservations in heaven, you know. And... Uh, so she had some faith, you know, and, and we, it's kind of like in the Bible, the, the man that had the problem with his son, and, and Jesus said that these come out only by believing, and, and he said, help, I believe, help my unbelief, and a lot of Christians have belief, but they got a lot of unbelief in their lives as well. So, um, if you will look in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So we gain confidence. We gain a connection. We gain a power by those three actions. Faith, trust, and actions. When I think about Noah... And he's surrounded by all these people who have gone the ways of the world and about how he had faith in God. The Bible says he walked with the Lord. That means that his faith with God was that he, he would talk to God and God would talk to him. God still does that. Uh, I've only met one man who claims he heard the voice of God. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he speaks through the Holy Spirit to us. We may not hear it with our ears, but we hear it in our hearts. And we know what we know. And so Noah had faith, and he trusted God. He trusted God that God was going to save him and everything else that he wanted on board that ark. And so he took action. Now, you know, trust is, is an amazing term. Um, Years ago, I knew this man who, uh, I hate to say this on a Sunday morning, but he had molested his daughters. He had two daughters. I knew them. I'd met them at Dry Creek. And uh, God saved him, though, after that time, after they had left home. And he talked to me about it. He said, I've asked their forgiveness. And uh, they say they've forgiven me. But he said, they don't want to be around me. I said, well, it's really simple, you know. You can forgive, 
but trust has to be earned. And they want to know if it's real before they're going to be around you. Can they trust you, you know? And see, Noah knew he could trust God. Think about your life. Do you really believe that you can trust God? That you're going to put your life in his hands? And because of that, you're going to take action in your life. Noah did that. He built that ark. He endured, I'm sure, we don't read about it in the Bible, but had to have a lot of humiliating attacks, you know, about here he's building a boat and we don't even have a lake around here to put it in, you know. And, but he kept preaching the truth. And by him having faith, trusting, he took action and the human race is here today. Is here today. And every culture that we know of has a story about a great flood. So, and Jesus talked about Noah and the ark. And so I believe it. You know, even if nobody had that story about the great flood, then I'd still believe it because Jesus said it. The Navajos have the story. Their story is like this. They got saved from the great flood because God transformed them into fish. And, and when the flood waters went away, they came back to being human beings. That was their traditional story that they had. I thought it was kind of a cute story, but anyway, you'll never know the thrill of being a Christian until you go beyond the flesh. In other words, you're depending on God. I told you about doing that revival in Belize. Um, I had five wonderful sermons to do that revival. Yeah, I had worked on them for weeks getting ready. Guess what? When I got there, God showed me you need to throw those five sermons away. And every day, God gave me a sermon. And he gave me illustrations from the people and where they lived that they could relate to it, you know? They couldn't relate to people in America. They've never been to America. They live in a jungle village. And so I had to rely on God every day. And he miraculously came through. But what really inspired me, and, and see, when you turn loose and you let God be God in your life, then, then you, you really understand the power of God. What started me going in that direction when I had all my sermons and everything was I was teaching school, and uh, I had over 50 days of sick leave accumulated. And so the trip was going to take place during the time of our Easter break. So I talked to my principal, who was a good friend of mine, and, and I said, I don't want to lie. I don't think God's going to honor that. I said, uh, is there any way that I can get sick leave without being sick? He looked at me and said, I don't think so. I said, well, okay, because I said, I don't want to lie about it. I don't think God will honor that. So then I read, this was in advance of the trip, I read in Guide Post Magazine, back when Guide Post Magazine was truly a Christian magazine. Today, I don't know what it is, but it's not a Christian magazine. But there's a story, a short story in there about this couple, uh, the, the preacher and his wife, and he's an evangelist, and him and his wife back in the 50s were, were going to California. He was going to preach a revival there. And uh, they stopped to gas up the car, and it was at night, and... Uh, they put the last $10 of their money in the gas, and they didn't have any money. And they're going down the road at night, and, you know, out in western states, and it's almost uninhabited. And he told his wife, he said, you know, I really don't think God wants us to be hungry before we make it to that church for the revival. And he said, why don't you pray that God supplies with some food? He said, we, we spent $10 on gas. Ask God to give us $10 for food now. And he said, you be in prayer and I'm going to be concentrating on the road, you know. So they're driving down the two-lane road out there in the west, old Route 66, and um, there's nobody on the road. And in the back rear view mirror, he sees a big 18-wheeler come down the road. And uh, he passed, the 18-wheeler passes him, and then he turns sideways in the road where they can't go any further. And his wife said, what is that man doing? And he got out of his 18-wheeler, and he comes walking up, and 
comes to her side of the car, and she's rolling the window up, you know, as before automatic windows, you know, she's rolling the windows up, and uh, she didn't get it quite shut. And he said, lady, and he shoves a $10 bill through the window. He said, when I passed you, I can't explain it, but God said to give you $10. And he said, here's your $10. And she, he didn't wait for a reply. He just went and got back, back in the truck and took off. And she's standing there sitting in the car looking at her husband like, wow, you know. And I thought, okay, God, I, I don't want this out of selfishness, but I want you to show me that you're behind all of this. And uh, I said, I figured out that I was going to lose $300 because they would deduct that from my pay to hire a substitute. And uh, I said, God, I'm going to ask you to show me it's you. I want $300 by such and such date because my wife and the kids, you know, we got to pay our bills. And it was on a Monday before we'd be leaving. And uh, so it was weird because people at church knew we were going. We weren't asking anybody to help us by any means, but people knew we were going. And so... Uh, we'd come out from church, you know, and leave the windows cracked so it didn't get too hot in the summertime, and, uh, or, you know, in the springtime. And so we'd find envelopes with money in them in the car. And so on Sunday night, we had $275. And I told my wife, I said, tomorrow's the deadline. <laughs> I said, God's got us within $25. I said, I don't know how he's going to do it, but we'll see, you know. So I went and taught school, and I come home from school, and my wife had checked the mailbox. She said, here, look at this, and she handed me the card. It was from my aunt who lived in Houston, and she said, I heard you're going on a mission trip, and she said, I want to help you a little bit. So there was a check in there for $25. Made $300. We never got a dime more. Exactly $300. You see, that's the power of God in our lives, if we'll let God be God. Not that I needed the $300. We could have made it. It had been a little tough, but we could have made it. And, um, but he showed me, hey, I'm behind this, you know. And, uh, boy, when I went down there, I was excited. I was on cloud nine to, to get to serve the Lord there. So God's Holy Spirit every day in our lives will empower you. He will give you the power that you need to live beyond your normal ability. Just allow God to be God. And um, he will do that in your life. If we do it without God, if we simply do it in the flesh, we'll fail. We'll fail every time. We need to have faith and trust in God. We must not live by our strength, but by the strength of God in our lives. In fact, Philippians says, uh, uh, for 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, uh, in the association several years ago, one of my jobs was to be the, uh, in charge of the historical committee. So I decided I was going to, to write a book on the Borgard Baptist Association. And uh, it was beyond my, my ability to do so, but I did a lot of research in the old yearly reports that were there. And what was fascinating was the prayer life of every church in our association during World War II. I talked to some of the older people. So I said, why was it the prayer meetings? Why were there so great in attendance? They said, because we had sons who were overseas. And said, we prayed for them every day. And we had prayer meetings that were just unbelievable. Yeah. There was a need. Uh, one of the chaplains at Fort Pope gave me a, a Bible that was camouflaged Bible from the Persian Gulf War. And he told me, he said, you know, I was so excited because he said, as I drove around in my Jeep, that there would be, I, I, he said, they knew who I was, and I'd just pull up and stop. And he said, boy, I'd, I'd be surrounded by these men, you know. And he said, I'd do a Bible study, a prayer meeting. And he said, I was so excited because God was so active in their lives. He said, 
Every t- place I stopped, he said, I didn't even have to say a word, man. They'd come around, you know, like flies. And he said, I, I was so excited because I just knew that when those men got home back in America, there was going to be a nationwide revival. And he said, my greatest disappointment was that when they got back home, it never happened. He said, why? He said, because they had foxhole religion. As long as they were in danger, they would turn to God. But once the danger was passed, they let go of it, you know. Too many Christians are like that, you know. We're, uh, we're not fair weather Christians. We're bad weather Christians. In other words, when there's real struggle in our life, then we get close to God. But we forget about him the rest of the time. And it, it certainly shouldn't be that. Um, all things in our lives are important. We wait until after, you know, uh, all else is exhausted. Then we, you know, well, we ask the doctor to perform a miracle. Uh, strangest thing in pastoring to me was when somebody in the church would be having surgery, you know, and, and you'd go and you'd have prayer with them before the surgery. The whole family would come around, you know. And uh, then after they'd bring that person back in the room and the doctor said they're going to be all right. And everybody's gathered in the room. I'd say, now let's join hands. Let's thank God for it. And they just had this startled look on the face. Why? You know, it's because they gave God the credit, but, you know, how quickly they forgot that he did the credit. When we lived in New Mexico, my wife had, uh, the doctor was sure she had breast cancer. And uh, so I called back home to Louisiana. I think there were, oh, goodness, at least a dozen churches that were praying for her. And uh, the day of the surgery, it was just me and her and the doctor in Gallup, New Mexico. And uh, there was nobody in the waiting room with me. And uh, the doctor came in and, uh, you know, you have any last questions or anything like that? And I, I said to the doctor, I said, Doc, I said, if you don't mind, I, I'd like for the three of us to hold hands and, and I want to pray for you. He said, oh, okay. And so I prayed for him and he came out. Uh, after the surgery into the waiting room, just him and I, and he said, man, I'm amazed at how God answered your prayer. He said, I've never been so sure in all my life. In 20 years of this job of cancer surgery, he said, I was certain she had cancer. He said, she didn't. She didn't. She had a cyst. That was it, a cyst. And so a week later, we went back for the post-op interview with a doctor, and he, uh, he said, you know, he said, I've been talking to the other doctors, friends of mine. He said, I told him, said, don't wait for your patient to pray for you. You need to pray for your patient, you know? And so uh, people are, are quick to forget the things that God has blessed in their lives. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So by walking close to God, you'll find that, that faith, that trust, and that action it's, it's almost like a rope that has three major strands in it. It's woven together. You know, it's, it's a lot stronger than a single strand. And we're just single strands. But when God and faith and trust come into play, we've got a strong rope, you know. Maybe you've got strong ropes experiences in your life. Uh, when I bought a place in the country, I had an old beat-up pickup truck, and I had some trees that didn't have much root system, and I'd I'd tie a rope, I had about that big around, and I'd tie it on my bumper of my truck, and I'd tie it on the tree, and I'd pull that tree over, you know. The rope, ne- the rope never broke, it's polypropylene rope, but it was a big tugboat-type rope, and it worked. It stayed together. So by daily walking with God, just like Noah did, uh, you'll not get ahead of God, but you'll be behind God, following him in your life. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Isaiah 40, 31. They, let's, let's say, if I said every one of your names, they that wait upon the Lord. You know what that wait means? Trusting, allowing him to be God. That, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Goodness gracious, I had a dream one time in which I could fly. And I was enjoying that. Oh, I was enjoying it. It was just unbelievable. I don't know if you've ever seen an eagle fly, but he can, he can fly so effortlessly. I mean, he just gets up and he rides almost like a, 
a buzzard. He rides those hot air currents and usually over a body of water, and he's looking for a fish, you know. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is God in your life, folks, to do all these things. Letting God be God in your life. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know, people offer all kinds of excuses for not being involved with God. You know, and I've told people that book is a book of love letters from God to you. And you tell me you're not going to read those love letters that he sent to you. Because when you read them, they're personal. They're personal. They're just exactly what you need. I've always been amazed. I love open windows and daily bread and stuff like that. I've always been amazed when I read that devotional. It was like, wow, that's what I needed for today. You know, it gave me strength. It gave me courage. And God does, does those sort of things through the reading of his word. For from learning his word so that he can speak that verse to you. And you'll know it. You'll know where those words came from. God wants that in our lives. So the question I suppose I have for you today is, is um, what do you need in your life today in order to be in step with the Spirit of God. Like most Christians, it would be commitment. Commitment to some idea, some action. Maybe it's commitment just to be more faithful in coming to God's church so that you're here constantly exposed through Sunday school and worship service and discipleship training and prayer meetings. The truth of his word that would encourage you. So... Uh, if our music director would come up here, I assume you will have an invitation song. And uh, we will invite you to allow God to be God in your life.